and undergoing recross examination by Mr. Sheck. Good morning again, Mr. Sims. Good morning, Your Honor. Mr. Sims, sir, you were reminded you were still under oath, and Mr. Sheck, you may continue with your nice tie, cross examination. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Mr. Sims, just a few more questions. <clears throat> we left off uh, yesterday when we were talking about uh, uh, Dr. Blake coming into your lab and documenting the evidence as you received it with photographs before you altered it and taking pictures of the test results. You recall that? Yes. Uh, now, you issued your first major report on the results of your work on January 4th. That, that was the first major report, yes, was on January 4th of 1995. And of 1995? Yes. And that was after the jury selection had been completed in this matter? I, I don't know when the jury selection was actually completed. I know it was. Uh, you doing test as the test of this trial continued, did you not? Yes. And you issued a second major report on April 6, 1995. Yes, that, I believe that is the correct date, April 6th. Yes, it January 24th, yes. Now, opening statements. Uh, The, the Department of Justice Laboratory said uh, that it is a challenge to sort out mixed it can be yes I agree that the difficulty of such a challenge is increased when the bloodstain mixture consists of primary contributors <coughs> and a number of unknown lesser contributors Well, some, sometimes if you see primary contributors, then it's a little easier. I would say it's more difficult when they're all equal. That could be more difficult mm -hmm. to sort out than if you see a distinct, say, two of these dots that tend to go together and then two other dots that tend to go together because they're weaker. Those are actually perhaps easier to sort out than when all the bands are equal. Um, and uh, I believe you also said on redirect uh, that when you have such a mixture in bloodstain evidence, that it's important to look at as many different markers as you can. Well, some, some markers are more informative, certainly, in sorting out mixtures than others. So the more markers you have, the more you can tend to sort it out. Now, I'd like to direct your attention to your analysis of the blood smears found on the console in the Bronco. Okay. You have that in mind, sir? And yes. You may want to consult your report. Okay. Um, looking at all the data, did you not reach the conclusion in terms of the DNA you found that Mr. Simpson could not be a minor contributor to any of the blood found on the console? You did not characterize him as a minor contributor with respect to any of those stains in terms of the DNA types found. Rephrase the question. All right. In your report, you came up with uh, three kinds of categories to characterize the 
level of contributions that you attributed to various different DNA patterns, did you not? Yes. One was minor con contributor? Yes. The other one was uh, main contributor? Yes. And then there was another in-between category of contributor? Yes. You couldn't say whether that... Uh, now, with respect to Mr. Simpson, we, on all the different swatches off that console, you never characterized the DNA pattern there consistent with Mr. Simpson as being a minor contribution. Yes, that's, that's correct. In fact, your findings say that the genotypes consistent with Mr. Simpson uh, was the only one found on uh, stain number 30 of the console. Yes. And that you characterized the DNA types on the DQ-alpha and D, uh, D1S80 system consistent with Mr. Simpson as being the main contribution to item 31. Yes, with the DQ-alpha. And the main contribution to uh, item 305. <coughs> The only complication there is 305, you recall, on DQ Alpha, we had the possible 1.2 allele on that. There was a little bit different interpretation because in that case, the 1.2 was the possible. But your report characterizes uh, that he could be the main contributor to stain 305. Those are your words. On, now, this is with regards to 305. To 305. No, I, I think in that one we listed him as contributor. If you look at the, the verbiage in the report, he's listed as contributing, as well as contributing to DNA 30, which is 305. And with respect to the person who contributed the four allele to stains 31 and 305, you characterized as minor contributor. Yes. Just a few questions on controls. Would you agree that with respect to contamination due to the handling of samples or PCR carryover contamination, that such contamination can be signaled by the appearance of product in blank controls and of mixed or inappropriate types in samples and in positive controls. Sustain. All right. Let's take it step by step then. Contamination due to handling, can it be signaled by the appearance of product in blank controls? Yes. Can it be signaled by the appearance of mixed or inappropriate types in samples? Yes. Can it be signaled by uh, the appearance of product in positive controls? By, I'm not sure I understand, by the appearance of product in yes, positive controls? Yes, in other controls? words, in the DQ alpha system, for example, would be dots sliding up. In other words, if the wrong dots slide up in a positive control? Well, you say wrong. Uh, uh, dots slide up that are not expected or inconsistent with interpretation. Yes, that, that could be a signal of that. For example, in uh, your lab, you have a positive control you run, that you run for DQ alpha that's 1.14. Yes. You run that in every case. Yes, we do. So the expected genotype you see when you run the strip is 1.14. Yes. And if you see uh, a dot light up at some intensity, and I understand that in your lab you have gradations. You have hints, you have traces, right? Yes. We, I, I, as far as, for example, looking at cross-hybridization type signals, yes, we, we characterize those. Could be cross-hybridization. Some instances could be contaminants. In other words, could a very weak signal be due to contamination? If, if, if that's all the information you had, then yes, that's true. Now, you agree that these negative and positive controls should be used rigorously? Yes, I agree with that. And do you agree that these controls 
are important for monitoring general contamination in a laboratory, not just the results of any particular <coughs> test or experiment. Yes, in other words, you, you monitor these on an ongoing basis for the entire laboratory. Is that the question? Yes. I, I would agree with that. And if a blank control is positive in one experiment, does it not indicate a potential problem not just for that one test or experiment, but for any test performed at about the same time? Well, again, I think what one would do would be to try to determine what the cause of a particular uh, signal on a blank was, and that may be isolated so that one would know that that's only due to a specific instance and not a general contamination phenomenon. Just so that uh, we're all clear on this, when we're talking about, for example, in the PCR system, you, you run uh, a tube, right? A series of tubes. Yes. And uh, we've, for example, in this uh, case, we've heard uh, sometimes they'll give in numbers like run number 60, run number 61. Uh, you have similar labeling in your laboratory. Well, we, I, I actually number with the case number and the item number right. is how I label. But let's say in, if there were, in the number of cases prior to this one, if there were, the controls indicated that contaminants were appearing in a laboratory, that could raise concern about the results in the test in a particular case, even if the controls in the test in the particular case were blank. Yes, it would raise concern. And that's true even in a laboratory contaminated with PCR carryover, blank controls do not necessarily become contaminated on every occasion. That's true. Now, and would you agree given the problem of contamination due to handling and carryover, that laboratories must incorporate contamination control into their standard operating procedure? Yes. And would you not agree that outbreaks of contamination and the steps to correct the problem should be carefully documented? Yes, I think, I think those kinds of instances should be reviewed and, and it should be the sort of thing where the laboratory takes an interest in what may have happened and tracked down if possible. Okay. My last... Now, Mr. Sims, since uh, we last uh, talked uh, before you came back for the end of your redirect examination, did you have an opportunity to examine uh, the diagram that Mr. Yamauchi made of the glove on June 14th? I, I've only s seen this briefly in, in uh, seeing Mr. Yamauchi's testimony, but I haven't studied this diagram, no. Okay. And let me just ask you a few short questions about the glove. Okay. Now, you've discussed the role of substrate controls and how important you thought it was that substrate controls be systematically alternated by the laboratory personnel collecting and handling the evidence. Yes, in other words, if there are substrate controls along with the stains, then those should be systematically right. processed, yes. There were no substrate controls with the glove, were there? I, I did not collect any substrate controls with the glove, no. I, I felt it was the, the entire glove had blood in almost all places. Well, more importantly, but I withdraw that. LAPD didn't take any substrate controls for the glove. You didn't receive any, did you? I, I don't know if, if they did actually select any areas or... or investigate any areas. I'm not, I'm not clear on that. My question to you, sir, in terms of samples you received, did you ever receive any substrate controls for the glove? Well, again, with the glove, I only received the glove itself. 
I didn't receive any of the cutouts that LAPD had made from mm -hmm. the glove, so I just had the glove itself to work with. Right. But, for example, you didn't receive any uh, cuttings uh, for as substrate controls the way you did, for example, with, the, uh, uh, with other swatches, other items. That, that's correct. Okay. And have you ever seen a photograph of the glove prior to, uh, other than ones at the crime scene, have you ever seen a photograph of the glove taken in a laboratory setting that reflected its condition before cuttings and alterations were made on it? I, I don't recall seeing a photo like that, although I'm having trouble recalling any LAPD lab photos of the glove. I don't know any of their photos mm -hmm. of, the, of the glove. Now, could you point out on this diagram the area where you found a piece of tissue? Would you like me to point out? Is that what yeah. you said? Yeah, could you just do that? to look backwards here because my notes are with the glove inside out. It would be on the thumb side underneath this area here, sort of where I'm, where I'm pointing. Mm -hmm. in, that, in that vicinity. Now, have you seen either in a form of a photograph or a document or a drawing or any form of documentation, an indication of where Mr. Fung removed a hair from the glove on the morning of June 14th. I, I haven't seen any of that documentation. So you would have no knowledge as to where or in what area Mr. Fung touched the glove on the morning of June 14th? Objection assumes facts not in evidence. Right? Sustained. Well, you have no idea what area he removed the hair from. Right, just rephrase, just rephrase, just rephrase the question. Right. Do you know where he removed, from what area he removed the hair? No. Um, and you're looking at an, your notes there? Yes. To, to, in order to figure out what you did and the order in which you did it? Well, I was looking at it to figure out the exact location as best I could show it on the diagram. Uh, you, could we just show that note for a second on the monitor here so the jury has an understanding of what you're looking at in terms of your notes? We'll have to mark it, right? Yes, we just mark this. Well, are these, what are these uh, pages from 69, uh, 69, 70, and uh, 71? What do those reflect? These pages ref are copies that reflect my actual examination of the glove itself. All right. And these, these reflect the examination of when you cut out G1, G2, G3, and G4? Yes, that's included. Okay. Uh, could you, let me just show briefly those diagrams on the monitor if I may. And I'll mark those pages. Uh, what are we up to? I'm sorry. About the whole package as 1191. 1191. Uh, are those your, excuse me, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Sims, are those your original notes? Those are copies. Copies, okay. I, I have an, another copy and I'll, I'll conform my copy. I'm sorry, 1193. Mr. Douglas, top for a second. And so that's your diagram and these are the kinds of notes you write that indicate as you're going along exactly what you're doing and how you're doing it. Yes. All right. And 
You directed, this is page 71, is it not? Yes, it is. All right. Let me just briefly go back and start at page 69. That would be the beginning of your examination. Yes, that's, that's the beginning of the examination of the glove. And you noted exactly what you did and who was present, and you made a diagram? Yes, I did. And then page 70, as you made the cutouts, you made additional diagrams and listed exactly what you did in the order in which you did it? Yes. You looked at page 71 and Okay, those, those are the ones that deal with G1, G2, G3, and G4. Is that correct? Yes. Mr. Sims, thank you very much. I have no further questions, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Sheck. Mr. Harmon? Just a moment, Your Honor. Certainly. Mr. Uh, Mr. Sims, Because you haven't seen a photo of the glove before it was sampled, does that mean to you it doesn't exist? No. You just haven't seen one? That's correct. Let's start with the mixtures, and I, I don't intend to ask you specifics about them, but Mr. Sheck asked you questions about the challenge in sorting out mixtures. Do you recall that just a moment ago? Yes. Now, in addition to sorting out mixtures, have you encountered cases where the fact that there's a mixture is of significance to you as a forensic scientist? Yes. Without being able to sort them out? Yes. You talked about the in what seems like another lifetime ago, the, the blood mixture case that you had, do you recall that? Yes, right. I talked about the blood being present from the two different individuals or consistent with the two different individuals. Where you were unable to sort them out. Yes, in that particular case, it was not easy to sort them out, as I recall. Okay. This case is one of those cases, is it not? Well, I, I think in particular, when you look at any one stain, that can be difficult to sort out. And to me, I tend to look at the totality of the, the, the interpretations. For example, Mr. Simpson alone could have been the source of number 30 from the Bronco console. I, I believe that's correct. Right. Let you me, need to look at your notes. Let me look at my fine. notes again. Yes. But when you move to 31, it wasn't consistent with Mr. Simpson alone. Is that true? That's correct. And regardless of your ability to sort it out, was that mixture consistent with two people who had recently been brutally murdered? Well, it was in 31, for example, it would be consistent with Mr. Simpson, the defendant, along with one of the victims. With one in this of the case. victims. And at 305, and 303, and 304, that was not a mixture, or that was not a stain that was consistent with Mr. Simpson alone. That's correct. It just happened to be consistent, those three stains, with a mixture of Mr. Simpson and two other people who had recently been brutally murdered. Is that true? Yes, that, that is correct as far as those three samples that you, that you mentioned. And, and just to distinguish between sorting out mixtures, this has nothing to do with sexual assault cases where there is a way to sort out the sperm DNA from the epithelial cell DNA. That's correct. When you looked at the glove and when you saw that tissue, you couldn't see that with your naked eye, could you? When I originally looked in that area of the glove, I looked for, there was a, red, a reddish stain in that notch area. And then 
I looked under the stereo microscope and that's where I noted that there was a possible piece of tissue. Now once I knew what that piece looked like, then if I got the light real strong and just right on it, I could, I could see it with the naked eye, but I had to use the strong light to, to see that. So what you were able to, vi or the way you were able to initially visualize it was through the stereo microscope. That's correct. And then knowing that it was there using some other lighting source, you were able to, to see it with your eye. Yes. Okay. Well, let's talk about the socks then in that same process. Okay. What did Greg Matheson communicate to you about the socks before you ever examined those socks? It's not offered for the truth of the matter. Let me see counsel sidebar with court report this. All right, thank you, Council. Mr. Harmon, proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Sims, before you received the socks, item 13, from, uh, sent from LAPD, were, were you made aware that Mr. Matheson had conducted some conventional serological testing on those socks? Yes. And when you were made aware of that, were you made aware that the conventional serological testing was performed on blood? Yes. Then you received the socks. Yes. Okay. And I want to just go through your initial observations on, on some of those socks, okay? Okay. But before I do that, I'd like you to define for us what you mean when you use the term visible to the naked eye. Well, in the, in the context of this kind of examination, I'm, I'm talking about situations where with the proper kind of lighting, intense lighting, for example, at an angle, you can see contrast. 
with the naked eye. In other words, you don't have to look under the microscope if you have the right lighting. So can we, can, just to paraphrase it, can we say not aided by some sort of amplification device? Yes, not aided by some sort of amplification device. Or magnifying device. Yes. Okay, and is that what you meant when you used that term yesterday? Yes, in the context of this sock examination. Okay, so you get the socks. You already know there's some blood on them. Uh, which of the socks did you... Last statement by Mr. Brown. It's the same phrase question. Okay. When you got the socks, you already knew there was some blood on them. Is that right? Sustained. When you got the socks, Mr. Matheson had already told you there was some blood on them. No, sustained. When you got the That's socks, you already knew that Mr. Matheson had conducted conventional serological testing on blood on those socks. Is that right? Yes. Which sock did you examine first? The initial exam was on the one that turned out to be 42B. Okay. Now, before you looked at those socks, um, were you aware that there were any markings on the socks? I'm, I'm not sure I understand. Before I looked at them? Before you looked at them, were, were you aware whether or not there were any markings on those socks, either A or B? Well, when I, when I first looked at them, it was the markings that caught my eye. Okay. Were the you aware that, there had, that those socks had previously been marked? No, I, I don't believe I was aware that they had been previously marked. Okay. And you first look at them, you see some markings. Yes, there were some white against the black of the sock markings. I believe you said that you looked at B first? Yes. Uh, can you describe what first caught your attention when you looked at B? The, there was a white outline around one particular area. Okay. What did you do then after you saw the white outlined area? I, I looked at the sock under the stereo microscope. Okay. At that point, had you noticed any other areas of discoloration on the sock before you resorted to the, micro, the, the uh, stereo microscope? No, the only, the only other marking that I noted at that time was that there was a looked like a 10 to 13, like a size indication on the sock. Okay, and were you looking at the sock, or, or strike that, this area that was outlined, did you ultimately designate that as a stain area and test it? Yes. What area was that? That was B1. Okay. Now, and you're looking at it with no, uh, or you were looking at it with the naked eye? Initially. Initially, yes. Okay, and then you use, use the stereo microscope? Yes. What did you see? Well, I noted that there was some reddish staining in that area. Now, is that the first time you noticed any reddish coloration? Yes, I don't believe I saw any reddish until I looked under the stereo microscope. <coughs> okay, at some point, did you then look at the other side of the sock? Yes, and I, yes, I did. Okay, and were you using the naked eye at that point? Yes, I believe so. Did you notice any apparent discoloration on the other side, opposite of 42B1? No, the only note that I made was there were no markings on that other side. And ultimately, you did find some areas of interest on that on the side that you flipped it over to. Is that correct? This this would now be the side opposite of the B1 yes. stain. Yes, I did find some areas of interest. So, but when you first looked at it with the naked eye, you didn't notice any areas of discoloration. That's correct. And there were no markings on that side? That's correct. Okay. Let's shift to sock A. Okay. How, how did you first examine that sock? Again, it was just a visual examination. Okay. No amplification? No, no magnification? No. The first thing was just the visual. You notice any markings on it? Yes. Is that what you noticed first? Yes, I noticed the, there was some writing, and then there were some arrows, um, that sort of thing. And what did you notice when you looked at the end of the arrow, the direction the arrow was pointing? Well, there was, 
there was in this particular area now this was what ended up being called a2 there was some um, some discoloration along one of the logos that is present on this sock when you say discolored are you telling us it was red at that point well again I it's only when I go to the stereo microscope that I noted the reddish of this of the stain and is that what you did next yes okay and you, you could see that it looked red yes under the stereo microscope I could see the reddish staining and then did you examine the other side of the sock yes and I, I'm I'm not sure if I examined the other side and then did the stereo microscopic exam on both or if I did one side and all, and also looked at the stereo okay I, well, it's not clear from my notes what did you notice when you looked at the other side, the side opposite 42A2? The side opposite 42A2 had that, that cut out near the ankle area. It had uh, an arrow, and it looked like it said 13A pointing to that. Um, there was also a cut out down more on the foot where there was a C. This is again in white. This white is used as the, the marking. And then did you use the stereo microscope to examine them more carefully? Yes. Okay, is that the first, and did you notice that those stains were a reddish color? Yes, again, I noted that with my initial stereo microscopic examination, there was some reddish still in that area around the cutout. And is that the first time you noticed the reddish, reddish coloration when you looked at it with the stereo microscope? Yes, I, I believe that was. And at some point, uh, did you take photos of these stains before you did any cuttings from the socks? Yes, I did. Use any kind of special lighting for that? Well, I, I took some shots to just show the overall socks using floodlights, for example, with a 35 millimeter setup on a camera stand. And under those, uh, f how, how would you describe the, that kind of lighting? Um, these are just intense tungsten light bulbs. They're very intense bulbs that give off a lot of light. And in, in taking the photographs of the stains that you've just described, were you then able to see other stained areas on the socks? Well, once, once I was at the point where I was taking the photographs and using that intense light, in that part of the process, I noticed some other discolorations on the side opposite of the, the LAPD cutout on sock A. And is that the first time you noticed them under that intense lighting? Stain, is that the first time you noticed those stains when you put the intense lights on them? Uh, it's still reading. It's a stain. When did you first notice those stains? Was it when you put the intense lights on them? Yes, it was during that process, and it's, it's pretty clear to me from my notes that that is the point at which I noted those additional ones was after this photography setup. Yesterday, Mr. Sheck asked you a question about DNA concentration, the difference between uh, concentration from a reference tube that's taken from someone and the concentration of DNA in something that comes out of somebody's artery. Do you remember that? Yes. Is there any difference in DNA concentration between those two sources? Objection to the characterization of the questions I asked him. That misstates the questions I asked him. Sustain. Just ask him the general question. Do, do you remember the question he asked you yesterday? Yes. What was it? As I recall the question, it was whether or not the blood from a tube, a reference blood tube, would be more concentrated in terms of its DNA uh, than other types of shed blood. And your answer was no. My, my answer was no. Because if it comes out of your artery, it's got the same concentration? Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sheck asked you some vague hypotheticals about cross inadvertent cross-contamination yes, yesterday. Mr. Harman, why don't you rephrase that question, please? Do you remember the hypotheticals Mr. Sheck asked you yesterday about uh, inadvertent cross-contamination? Yes. And I believe you expressed uh, an <laughs> fact, the fact.
this a number of times. It is. Objection it's as also cumulative. Con co comment by counsel not conducting the examination as well. Or we'll briefly. Yes, the, the idea that inadvertent contamination would be expected to be a sporadic sort of thing so that one swatch may receive some of this contamination, but the other swatches wouldn't. That's the concept. Okay. Now, Mr. Sheck uh, had some questions of you about LAPD items 45 and 51. Do you recall that yesterday? Yes. Those are the front gate and the... Uh, hand railing samples, I believe. Okay. And without going over things again and again, would the fact that there's foliage nearby and soil and biological material, would that be of significant interest to you in deciding whether bacterial contamination could cause degradation? In other words, if those things in the environment contributed to the material on that substrate, yes. Sure. Um, Your Honor, I'd like to have marked this uh, People's Next in Order photograph of that area showing the front gate at Bundy. 291. 291. Oh, it's got both. Mr. Sims, or can I put it up on the elbow here? Mr. Sims, would you look at 291 for identification and, and I'd just like you to take in the whole picture there, vegetation, dirt, things like that. You had a chance to look at that? Yes, I, I can see that. Okay, and um, what can you tell us in terms of potential for biological material uh, contributing bacterial input to any blood stains that may have been collected in that area? I have a foundational objection to this from a photograph in this fashion. Well, well, again, I note that there's there appears to be foliage overhanging that general area, and there's that that's the main thing that I I see in this photograph. And is that a potential source for biological material that could contribute bacteria that might contribute to degradation of blood stains? Yes, any any of that biological material such as that. Your Honor, I'm going to show, you might want to cut the feed. I want to show a previously marked exhibit, People's 42, for identification that's a little more distant shot. You had a chance to look at that, Mr. Sims? Yes. Okay, just I want you to assume that 45 and 51 are from the hand, 45 from the handrail that you can see in the, the foreground there, or the background rather, and 51 from the, the bottom part of that gate. And, and what could you tell us about the potential for biological material con contributing to degradation of blood stains that may be collected in those areas? Well, as this perspective shot shows, it appears that that gate swings out into an area of vegetation. Okay. 
And, and could that be the source of biological material that could cause blood stains to be degraded? Well, again, if there's, if there's biological material, then conceivably there's bacterial growth in that area and that sort of thing, yes. Your Honor, I'd like to have Mark this People's Next in Order photograph of that handrail. And that be 292, Your Honor? 292. And that put it up on the Elmo? You may. Okay, Mr. Sims, uh, assume that's where 110 is, is item 45 that you just saw in the other photograph. This is just a close-up photograph of that. Okay? Okay. Um, it, is this the kind of uh, area that might have bacterial or bacteria on it that could impair your ability to type those blood stains? Well, again, any any surface such as that could have some bacterial growth or some bacteria on it. Okay, okay Mr. Sims, um, Mr. Sheck asked you questions about substrates and similarity of the front gate painted surface and the rear gate painted surface. you recall that yesterday? Yes. Is, is substrate just one factor in determining uh, what might impair your ability to type stains, such as the Bundy walkway stains and such as 45 and 51? Well, by substrate, for example, if we're talking about a painted metal surface, it, it depends a lot on what kind of environment, micro environment that surface is in, actually. If it's near an area where there's more soil and vegetation, that would be different from a, a cleaner area, basically. So environment is more important than the substrate? It can be, yes. Okay. In fact, 45 and 51 do show the same signs of bacterial induced degradation as 47, 48, 49, and 52. Is that correct? Well, I think there was there were three that we definitely saw that in from the Bundy drops, and it's the same thing that we saw, the same pattern that we saw in 45. I'm sorry, 45 and 51. And. The, does bacteria come, if a person dropped a drop of blood on a, on a clean substrate, would you expect to find bacteria in there? Well, there are bacteria everywhere in the world. I mean, bacteria are everywhere. It's, it's whether or not the bacteria are placed in a moist environment where they can, warm environment that's moist where they flourish, that's really the issue. Okay, could, could there, uh, so, would the fact that stains that uh, were collected are already having bacteria on them and put in a plastic bag in a moist condition, how would that impact on the bacteria that's already there? Well, under those conditions, those bacteria would be thriving. They would be reproducing, growing, and so they would, that there would be growth of the culture, and so then that would lead to more degradation of the DNA in the blood. This time I'd like to have marked this people's 292 for identification, a photo of the rear gate at Bundy. 293, I believe. Mr. Sims, I'd like you to take a look at these photos, and I'm going to ask you to assume that they're photos of the rear gate at Bundy, where 115, 116, and 117 were collected from on July 3rd, okay? Okay. Mr. 
Mr. Sims, do you see the, any signs of the same kind of vegetation in the area of 115, 116, and 117 as you did in 45, with respect to 45 and 51? Can I, can I actually see that photograph, the lower photograph? Sure. Could I hand it to you? Certainly. Why don't you hand him both photographs? It, it appears there's, there is a little bit of ice plant in that general area, if I'm, if I'm seeing this correctly, but it's not as, doesn't appear to be as dense a growth as in the other, the front end samples. Okay. Mr. Sims, um, I just want you to assume for purposes of this question that 115, 116, and 117 had been in the same kind of biological environment as 45 and 51. Okay. Okay. If those stains were dried after collection and not stored in a hot truck in plastic bags for several hours, okay, would okay. you expect the same kind of bacterial-induced degradation as you found in 45 and 51 and 47 and 48 and 49? No, I, again, I think the key is to get these samples collected and dried as soon as possible because it's that incubation period when there's the moisture and the heat that allows for the bacteria to thrive and to, to the culture to grow and that leads to the degradation of the blood. In fact, you didn't see the same kind of bacterial induce contamina contamination in 115 through 117. That's, that? that's correct. Okay. Mr. Uh, Sheck asked you a question about systematically alternating between substrate controls and stains just a little while ago. Do you yes. recall that? Um, you feel that is an important safeguard? Yes. Uh, how important do you feel uh, as a safeguard using only one coin envelope? open at a time well that that to me is, is is especially critical because that is not only a check on cross-contamination but it also tends to prevent sample mix-up in other yeah. words there's only one sample that you're dealing with at a time so you're not likely to mix it with another sample and how about only having one micro centrifuge open at a tube open at a time yes i think that's very important because then the contents of one can't get into the contents of another tube and finally, Mr. Sims, I want you to assume that 45 and 51, 47, 48, and 49 were collected on June 13th. Okay. And furthermore, 115, 116, and 117 on the rear gate were collected on July 3rd. Okay. Okay. Given the different environments in which the group of 45, 51, 47, 48, 49, and 50 were collected from okay. when compared with 115, 116, and 117. You with me so far? Yes. And given the different dates of collection of the two groups of samples. Okay. Okay. Is there anything about the differences in the amount of DNA in these stains which tells you scientifically when 115, 116, and 117 were deposited on the rear gate. I'm going to object to this hypothetical with respect to foundations concerning A, the environment, that, and B, objection, Your Honor. Well, foundations, well, house, foundation, okay. yeah. and times. Over. Okay. No. Thank you. No further questions. Check. Mr. Sims, some stains on the sock were more apparent than others. Objection is made. Is the time oh. the, 
the only stain that seemed a little bit more apparent to me would be that that one that was on the logo that I think we called 42A2. That was more apparent to me. And again, keep in mind, I didn't see A1 until after it was sampled. Yeah, but you got the sock, you looked at it, and you saw visible to the naked eye red discoloration, discoloration that you, ca that you characterize as a blood stain at A1, right? Is the time, Your Honor. Oh. Can you? Sure. I'm sorry. The first time we discussed this on cross-examination, in fact, I think it was on even your direct examination, didn't you indicate that when you looked at SOC A1 without the aid of a stereo microscope, you saw by that arrow the discoloration that you identify as the blood stain at A1? Yes, I think you could see some discoloration in that general area. And then on that same sock, there is a cutout. Well, there, the, I think what you're saying is, is the cutout that's adjoining whatever's left? Yes. There's a large cutout in the ankle area of the A sock. Yes, there is a large cutout. And I think... You've testified that the material of this sock, and we've seen it, is a smooth, silky kind of material? It's smooth, yes. And in the areas where you identified blood stains, the material tend to become, in your words, crinkled and puckered? Yes, in some of those areas it did. Now, we, Mr. Harmon asked you questions again about that B1 area of the sock that we saw yesterday under the stereo microscope, correct? Well, that's, we looked in that general area, yes. That's the one that everybody got out and looked at under the stereo microscope. Well, that's, actually that stain was an unsampled area that was just below B1. Right. Would it be fair to say that those areas that we spent time looking at under the stereo microscope were the one, with the, with the areas where you first identified the stain looking under the stereo microscope. That what happened with the stain. Well, talking about your examination, you've told us that there was, that to the best of your recollection, and you're not completely sure of it, there was one stain area that you first were able to visualize under the stereo microscope as opposed to seeing it first with your naked eye without enhancement. Well, there were, there were several areas that I couldn't see with the naked eye that I could only see with the stereo microscope. In terms of the ones you sampled, that was the only one that you first saw with the stereo microscope as opposed to looking at it with the naked eye. I'm talking about the ones you cut. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I, can you restate that? Right. I, I think we have testimony on it. Let me just get to this. The area that we were looking at yesterday on the stereo microscope, would it be fair to say that that was one of the areas that was harder to visualize with the naked eye in terms of seeing the discoloration as opposed to other areas? Well, again, the only other area that, that I would say would be easier to see it on would be that one on the logo, that A2 stain. Okay. And you can't tell us what the cutout area would have looked like in terms of the blood on it before you saw it, because when you got it, it was cut out. Well, that's right, and that's why I looked at the margins under the stereo microscope, and that's when I saw the reddish in that area. Mm -hmm. So there was even reddish in that area after the cutout had been done? Yes. And when you look at that fringe area of the cutout, with the naked eye without a stereo microscope, you can see the discoloration. I, I think there's some subtle discoloration in that area, yes. Okay. Now, Mr. Harmon asked you some questions about the console and the Bronco. Can you tell us the order in which biological material was contributed to the console from your tests? No. Um, 
you can't tell us what biological material might have been on the substrate of the console uh, before what appears to be blood was deposited on it. That's correct. Um, Mr. Harmon, I think before I asked you questions about uh, bleeding noses. Do people have runny noses when they have colds? I do. Oh. Do children have runny noses? Yes. Do adults have runny noses? Yes. Do people touch substrates and consoles and cars, in your experience, with their hands? Yes. Now, in terms of other contributors to the smears on the console, you found other genotypes than Mr. Simpson's. That's correct. And from your tests, you can't tell us whether the other genotypes came from one person, two people, or even three people. That's correct. And, you fa and on the steering wheel, in the strip you looked at, the only dots visible were 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 and 4. On, on, this is now on the steering wheel. Sample. Item number 29. The only dots you saw on the strip were 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 and 4. Well, I, again, I, the, the I'm control talking about what dot you saw. The control dot was present. And the and, control dot. And I believe the all but dot was present. And Selmark's result is that that was a one point, their conclusion was that it was a 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 and a 4, and they excluded Mr. Goldman. It is. All right. Now, Mr. Harmon asked you about single coin envelopes being a good control against uh, cross contamination and sample mix up, right? Yes. I think it would help in terms of controlling against sample mix-up to count the number of swatches when they're collected and put counts on the coin envelopes and the bindles where they're originally corrected? Compound, argumentative, sustained, phrasing question. Would counting the number of swatches at collection and putting that number on a coin envelope or a bindle, would that assist? in terms of guarding against sample mix-up? It, it might. Would that assist in maintaining the integrity of evidence in terms of chain of custody? Well, I think it, at some point it would seem reasonable that if, there, if these swatches are going to be sent out that there should be a count at some point. Now, you were asked a series of questions about the handrail and the front gate, correct? Yes. Contrasting it to the substrate on the back gate. Yes. And, you're at, and, and uh, you've never been to Bundy, have you? I, I've never been to the crime scene. Now, no. let's look at this. I guess we'll start with the handrail. We look at those. And Mr. Sheck, which photograph is this? Oh. P291 and P292. All right. Thank you. Comparing the state of the paint on that handrail to the back gate, would it be a fair statement that the paint on that handrail shows less evidence of flaking and rusting than the back gate? Sustained. Well, Found foundation. Have you looked at a picture of the back gate? Yes, I have seen a picture of the back gate. And in the picture of the back gate, do you not see that the lower rung of the back gate 
there is some flaking of the paint. I, I recall seeing some something like that on that, but again, I I'd like to see that photo again if, we'll if show that's it in an a issue. Second. And would you not agree that flaking of paint would be an indication of exposure to moisture? Sustained foundation. Would uh, moisture be a factor in enhancing bacterial degradation? Yes. A significant factor? Yes. Uh, in other words, from the microenvironment as you characterized it, if bacterial agents got on a substrate, exposure to moisture would hasten or accelerate the bacterial degradation. Yes. Mr. Sims, do you have the front gate picture there? That chance? No, these are just the rear gate, I, I believe. The front gate did not uh, uh, give genotypes consistent with Mr. Simpson. Um, I'd have to check what those results were. That's that's some of the very recent work that we did. Right. Now, oh gosh, uh, we focus first on this photo, which is. Uh, Do you want tighter or brighter? Um, or both? I guess what distresses me a little bit is that it, it appears to me much clearer on the monitor than it does here. Can we brighten that up at all? Describe if you get the light. Now let's look at the uh, micro environment of the back gate. Does it appear to you that there are a number of berries and other foliage material across the steps leading up to the back gate? Just, just from this view, it, it appears that there is that sort of material. And on the substrate at the top of those stairwells, you see more would appear to be berries and foliage. Well, now, I thought we were talking about the rear gate as opposed to the, you're talking about the substrate now being the top step there? Yeah, I'm talking, let's just foc focusing your attention from the top step going back towards the rear gate. You see more foliage and, uh, uh, do you recall it from the other photograph being berry material in that area? I, I can't really see the, the berries, but I, I think that looks like foliage. And the substrate where sample number 50 was collected, you know from photographs, is just in front of that rear gate. Yes, I believe that's correct, although I don't know the exact dimensions on these. Uh, and number 50, which is collected on that substrate right near the rear gate, Connection to the characterization right here, Your Honor. Sustained. All right. 50, which is collected in the area of the rear gate, without going back and getting the exact number <coughs> of feet, that blood stain you found to be severely degraded. Yes, that's what that indicated. And you don't know how long. 115, 116, and 117 were in plastic bags on July 3rd. I, I don't have that information. You have no idea how hot it was. 
No, I don't. You have no idea how long Mr. Fung kept those around before he took them to the evidence processing room and uh, went through whatever procedures he did to dry them? Yes, I don't have that information. Picture uh, taken on June 13th. I don't believe so. Is that the front gate? Yes. I'm sorry. All right. Now, you understand, do you not, Mr. Sims, that given the numbering system of LAPD, this is photo ID number 116, but item number 51. You have that in mind? Yes. I, that's my understanding is that that, that 116 in the, fo in the photograph goes with a photo number, but not with a booked right. item number. So this is item number 51, the front gate sample collected on June 13th. That's your understanding? I, I believe that's correct, but I, I can check something on that. Now, does it appear to you that the gate here is peeling? Objection, no foundation. Oh. In this, in this photograph, I, I don't see any evidence of that. All right. Now, this gate, you indicated before, opens up into an area where there's some foliage, correct? Yes, it looked like there was actually some foliage that sort of hangs over it when it's opened. Let me show you what is equals 294. And let's see if we can get as tight there as we can to the gate itself. Oh. Let's just stop there for a second. Uh, now, will you agree that uh, it appears as though we have berries and leaves uh, and soil material on the substrate leading up to the gate? Yes, I, in general, I, I can see what you're, you're talking about. I can't see those as berries unless you'd, somebody right. told me those are berries, but that looks like leaves and soil and that sort of thing, yes. And uh, over time, would you not expect in mornings that there might be moisture or dew? Over, let's say, a three or four week period, three week period? Well, um, th th certainly there may be some, some dew Objection formation, but. Speculation, no foundation. Assisting. Well, I've had a lesson on uh, weather conditions in June and July in Los Angeles, no, in Brentwood. Oral. Have a seat. That's a question. Uh, let's let's fin it. I think it was in response to the court's comment about witnesses from out of town talking, making assumptions about weather conditions. In well, I understand yeah. that. All right, Mr. Let's, let's well, just let's, let's, let's just move on. This. Move on to uh, move on, Mr. Uh, Mr. Sims. Uh, over a three-week period, would not exposure to moisture and the biological material that you just see in the substrate in terms of wind blowing it against the gate, would that not be a factor in terms of assessing bacterial degradation of any blood stain on that gate? Objection assumes facts not in evidence, no foundation. Oh. I, I'm sorry, I didn't understand what was being blown on the gate. Well, would it be, I'm asking you to assume that over a three week period, wind will blow materials such as you see on the substrate in this photograph onto the gate area. Okay. That's part of, uh, when you were answering Mr. Harmon's questions with respect to microenvironments, you were making assumptions. It was part of your reasoning, was it not, that uh, uh, some of these bacterial agents from the foliage would become airborne and deposit themselves on the substrate. Well, for example, from droppings and that sort of thing, yes. Okay. Um, and that would apply to this rear gate as well as it would apply to the front gate? Well, if there's, again, if there's material that drops down onto it, that would be true. Well, can we go a little tighter to the... Uh...
Now, do you see how the door from the rear gate <coughs> opens onto an area where there's foliage? Yes, I, th I think I noted that earlier. And you see some uh, what appears to be leaf-like material just near the gate, don't you? Do you mean we're now touching the, the gate? The larger chunks at the, uh, at the gate itself. Yes, that, that looks to me like ice plant. And you even see part of the plant sticking up through and touching the gate on the, uh, where, where it hinges, the right-hand side. You see that? Yes. All right. to inspect these microenvironments, have you? I have not. You did some examination of uh, uh, fibers from the, uh, the bronco, did you not? Did you see any evidence of berry-like material in the fibers uh, from the bronco you examined? Your Honor. Sustained. But no further questions. Just a couple of questions, Mr. Sims. Um, this rear gate microenvironment with the berries and the dog chew and everything back there and this hypothetical about wind blowing stuff up on the gate, I, that I, it's, it's introductory, it Your Honor. It's fact and sustain. Ask a question, Counselor. You know anything about wind blowing berries up on the rear gate? No. I think the wind could blow a berry up on 117. You've seen that yeah, picture. It would have to be a very strong wind, I would think. Okay. Mr. Sims, a bottom line, is there anything about what you saw in 115, 116, 117, even in Mr. Sheck's microenvironment, that undermines the fact that they could have been there from June 13th? No. And let's talk about how long does they, those stains may have been in plastic bags in a truck on July 3rd when uh, Mr. Funk collected them. Do you remember the question? Yes. Is what's important whether or not you see bacterial contamination causing degradation? Yes, it's, it's sort of the bottom line is what do you see when you actually look at the yield gels on these particular samples and whether or not the phenomenon has occurred and you is indicated by the yield gel. And you didn't see the same kind of contamination or degradation in 115, 116, 117 as you did in the ones from the walkway. That's correct. Even if they had been in the truck as long as they, as they had been on June 13th is what's important, Judge. the fact that you don't see the degradation? Judge. Sustain. I don't have any other questions. All right. Bottom line is the facts, Mr. Sims, about how much bacterial degradation you saw on 115, 116, and 117. You didn't see it. I did not see that same pattern that I saw in the other samples from Bundy. And Number 50 collected from the substrate in the area of that gate, you saw it? I believe that was one of those that showed up on the yield gel, yes. And the substrate of the front gate, you, did, you saw a bacterial uh, uh, degradation of, that st of those stains, the item number 51 that was collected on June 13th. Yes, I saw that pattern on the yield gel. And from the handrail, that substrate, you saw bacterial degradation. And I the saw, samples collected on June 13th. I saw that same pattern, yes. But from the samples that were collected on July 3rd, from that back gate, 117, 116, 115, you didn't see that bacterial degradation, did you? That's correct. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Sims, I think we're finished. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, as far as the court session this morning is concerned, we're going to take our recess at this time. We're going to uh, shift to a different focus uh, of the evidence, I'm told by the attorneys, uh, shortly. 
and the parties who are involved in that presentation are not available until tomorrow morning. So we're going to stand in recess as far as the jury is concerned until tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Please remember all of my admonitions to you. Do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Don't form any opinions about the case. Don't conduct any deliberations till the matter has been submitted to you, nor are you to allow anyone to communicate with you with regard to the case. I see jurors mouthing the words with me. Thank you. All right. Just as long as you remember them all. All right. You all have a pleasant evening. We'll see you tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock. All right. We'll stand in recess. All right, Mr. Sims. Thank you very much, sir.